Welcome back, everyone, to episode number eight of the Beginner to Master Speedrun. I'm currently rated 745, and in honor of getting to episode eight, I've changed my profile picture to a time where I was eight years old. I actually played my first chess tournament when I was eight. So um, as I progress with episodes, I think I'll be changing my profile picture to show how I've progressed through time. But uh, yeah, anyway, let's get into it. I'm going to hop into the 10 minute pool. And I am playing Bradley, 23 raw. Let's play e4. And okay, opponents rated 830. So yeah, my opponents are gradually getting higher rated. So we might see uh, more, more common, more kind of competitive openings. I'll play the Italian, bishop to c4. And we have the two knights. Now I could go for knight g5. This is uh, perhaps the beginning of a fried liver, but I'm gonna be solid, play d3. This is probably what I would have played at eight years old. And um, yeah, it's a more kind of slow and steady approach. Now black plays a6 here, which strikes me as a little bit odd. Uh, usually like if white's playing the Spanish, then a6 makes sense to attack the bishop. But in this case, I think I'm just going to get a, a free move of development. Um, and now knight g5 maybe makes a bit more sense. Because I think d3 is a lot more useful than a6. If we imagine knight to g5. Uh, if black plays d5, I can take. And usually the best move there is knight a5. But because my bishop is already defended, I could play knight c3 and try and hold on to the pawn. So I think I will go for knight g5. Now knight g5 is not always uh, the move to go for. Uh, usually it's it's not great if black can respond by castling to defend the pawn with the rook. But in this case, yeah, there's not too many ways to actually save the pawn. And uh, I think maybe black will be very soon regretting having played a6 rather than developing. So we'll see what the opponent does here. Yeah, we do see d5. I'll take it. And there is a pretty well-known tactical sequence. Uh, this is very similar to the fried liver, uh, which is without the inclusion of d3 and a6. Uh, so if these pawns were back, we would be in a, a very well-known position. And I'm going to go ahead and just take on f7 just relying on the fact that uh, I've, I've seen this tactical sequence before. And the idea is after the king takes, I mean, there's really not too many options for black, otherwise I'll win the queen or the rook. So king takes f7, I'll respond with queen f3 check. Uh, but that's not happening. Wow, queen f6. Allowing me to either take the rook or take the knight. Do I want the cake or the ice cream? I can only have one, at least one at a time. I mean, taking the knight actually seems a little bit more attractive. Because then I keep the attack on the rook, and I defend my knight. If I take the rook immediately, then maybe there's cases where my knight gets stuck in the corner. So, yeah, let's take the knight. I'm imagining my opponent will play bishop c5 and friend checkmate and... Uh, and then maybe say, oh no, my rook. Uh, then the rook will be poisonous. So if bishop c5, yeah, it's very important to be hyper alert of the danger in the position. And I would probably respond with castling or queen e2 or even queen f3. I think there'd be a, a few different acceptable moves there. Now it's possible my opponent will also try and save the rook with rook to g8. But then that will give me time to maybe keep attacking, like maybe play bishop g5 with the queen. Um, but now, yeah, I definitely don't want to play bishop g5. Definitely don't want to take the rook. Uh, castling, I think, is my top option. Queen e2 is also fine, defending and maybe aligning with the king. Uh, but I don't want to be in a spot where my queen is tied down to defending. I'd rather maybe someday get the queen to h5 and use it as an attacking piece. 
So casting it is. And what's interesting here is black could legally castle. Sometimes at the beginner level, there's confusion with when you can castle and when you can't castle. But when the rook is attacked, it doesn't stop you from castling. It's only when the king is attacked or one of these squares is controlled. Uh, but we see my opponent just completely ignore the king side, centralizing the knight. And now, yeah, it's a question. Do I just take the free rook? Is there anything black can do to hurt me? I don't think so. Let's take the rook. And it's always important to like double and triple check to make sure the opponent's not threatening anything. But f7, it's really the main target, which is well defended here. And the knight can't really move forward without being taken. And meanwhile, yeah, maybe queen h5 is coming. So I'm up a rook and a knight. And a pawn. I forgot about the pawn that I won uh, much earlier. So up a lot of material here. But you can never celebrate too early. Um, Black does have decently active pieces. But it's hard to actually like, orchestrate much of an attack. Black could try bishop g4 to deflect my queen away from defending c2. But I think that I'd be happy to take the bishop. So we see c6. And I mean, the natural move is probably to retreat. Bishop f7 looks a little bit interesting. Bishop f7, king f8. I don't know if I'm achieving so much there. I mean, I do get initiative. Like, black would have to move the king rather than playing a more aggressive move. So... Yeah, perhaps it's a, it's a fine choice. And there's also cases where if the king moves to one of these squares, then I'll be very much inclined to make some tactics work along the, the dark square diagonal. Uh, but we do see king f8. And I think from here it's a matter of just continuing developing. Like, this is a weird construction. My knight is in the corner. It's defending the bishop, which is sandwiched between the king and the queen. But I think I'm okay leaving everything as is and just bringing in uh, another piece. And with knight c3, I'm not only developing and controlling the center, but I'm preparing knight e4, which would be really nice to centralize a knight and... Now triple forking a queen, pawn, and bishop. This pawn is attacked twice by the knight and bishop. I guess I should have realized with g5, black was threatening to take the knight. Maybe I'm losing back a little bit of material because after it takes, I take the bishop, black takes my bishop. Then I'm only up a rook. But... Only being up a rook is is kind of like only having a ton of money being in a very comfortable spot. So, uh, yeah, I really don't mind trading here. And now, yeah, now I think it's time to play queen h5, start harassing the king. The so queen is now cornered. These pieces still undeveloped. Bishop is ready to come in, most likely with check. Like if the king moves to e7 or f6. Uh, the king could try and retreat. But, I mean, if I want to, I could pre-move bishop takes g5. We'll see where black goes first. Yeah, king f8. I don't think there's any reason to throw in another check. It gives black time to try and use a queen as a defender. So let's take the pawn. And at this point, I'm already looking for ways to create some mating net. Like I have the bishop and queen and knight kind of swarming around. Can use this shark metaphor again. Maybe I'll have to put in the Jaws music. Um, yeah, the, the lone king is a bit stranded. F4 may be coming. Another shark will maybe have a nice feast. 96. 
6, queen h6. Feels like I'm almost, like almost winning something by force. I could play bishop h6 too. I think this is a spot where I don't want to take too long. I just want to simplify. Um, I kind of like <laughs> like a lot of things here. What to do? Let's play bishop h6. Ensuring the knight can't take the bishop. The queen can't block. Probably see king e7. I'm thinking a nice approach is simply to trade and then attack the pawn. Let's go for that. I'm going to play rook a to e1. It does seem weird putting this rook on e1 rather than the other rook, because now this rook has no legal moves. But I'm imagining there might be a case where I play f4, especially if there's going to be a pin along the e-file. Uh, but meanwhile, there's really no great-looking way for black to defend e5. Maybe with the exception of king d6, it's the only move to defend the pawn another time. Uh, but then surely the king should be more of a target. And if we do see king d6, maybe then I play f4 to target the pawn. If the trade happens, then bishop will come in with check, and then both files will be open. We see queen g8. All right, let's uh, snag a pawn. Opponent is resisting. Like, I'm trying to win quickly here, but uh, it takes a little bit more work. The other rook will come in. And if I can create the battery on the e-file, then yeah, there's not going to be too much hope for black to defend. Um, it's a nice thing about having the extra material is I just, uh, yeah, I have one more piece to attack with. And maybe a move like bishop f4 coming. Like sometimes in these spots, you want to look for the forcing moves, like the checks, but all the checks that I have just lose material. There's really no great looking checks. So a move like bishop to f4 just sets up a, a load of discoveries, uh, like rook g5 or rook e8, both of which will be check. I guess the one thing I should have mentioned is if my opponent didn't take on a2 and played bishop d5, then bishop f4 would lose the game due to queen takes g2. So I still have to be aware of of how I could lose a game. And sometimes this is a good kind of mental exercise is when you're completely winning, you just want to take a moment and ask yourself, like, how can I possibly lose this position? And that will hopefully allow you to avoid uh, making a fool of yourself. Because really the only way white can lose here is if I allow a checkmate on g2 or somehow I allow a back rank mate, like if, if somehow the rook, black rook comes to uh, the back rank, but that's not going to happen. And from here, I see checkmate in three moves. I get three moves, maybe two moves. The queen does a nice job swinging across the board. And it's funny, I hear ambulance noises in the background. Uh, <laughs> someone call an ambulance for my opponent. But uh, it was a nice game. Um, yeah, my opponent, I think, got a little bit of, I don't know, careless or, or just played a little bit inaccurately in the opening and then just immediately walked into trouble. And I guess I didn't really have time to explain the main idea behind knight takes f7. Uh, but the idea was if king takes, which is what most people would play, then queen f3 check. And now the the queen attacks the king and the knight. Black would like to play knight f6, but the knight is pinned. So uh, black is already in big trouble here. If king g8, then white's just mating. Like, there's no way to escape the inevitable checkmate. 
and if king to e6, this would be the best try for black. And this does actually save the piece, but after knight to c3, uh, the position is much preferable for white. There's three attackers against a pin knight on d5. And yeah, even if black defends it with knight e7, I think a move like castling and rook e1, and white has full compensation for uh, being down a little bit of material. So hopefully an important lesson to take away. And yeah, maybe at some point, like during the series, if I encounter this opening again, I'll play knight g5. And if after this, 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 this is, uh, I think, known to be like the main fried liver variation. And it's the same exact idea. With inclusion of a6, d3, I think white's already more for choice because the bishop has a nice development. But um, yeah, as black, you either have to know this line well, like play d5, take, and then know the move knight a5. Or in this position, uh, black should have just played bishop c5. And this is a case where if knight g5, castling, black defends f7, and the game goes on. So um, hope there's some lessons to take away from that game. Let's do another one. Um, new tenant game. And playing Sharu, rated 783. I'm white again. Are we going to see the same opening? Fried liver deja vu. Okay, we see bishop c5. So this is more of a, a mainstream Italian. And in this line, uh, d3 is still completely acceptable, mainly looking to complete development. And I'm going to stick with an opening that I played when I was like seven and eight years old, which is maybe not the most exciting looking position. Uh, basically a four knights. Now, it's funny, my opponent is going for this attack. Uh, feels like we see this a ton at uh, this rating level. Um, but compared to last game, yeah, I'm, I'm in time to castle to defend my f-pawn. And black is basically wasting time moving the knight, because uh, most cases it's not going to be good for black to trade on f2. Uh, the two minor pieces are more valuable than the rook. So knight d4 is an interesting move, uh, does offer the trade of knights. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is I can take the knight and then attack the undefended knight on g4. And that is one of the downsides of putting the knight here so early. It's not defended and it's a target by my queen. So... I think I'll go for knight takes d4. I don't want to take on e5 because then the knight can take back and I just lose material. So I'll take. And if the bishop takes, then I'm going to win the piece. If the pawn takes, then my knight would have been counterattacked. Um, I'd probably still win material in that line. So I just won a knight. Now this could still get interesting because black has a move here which attempts to win back material, uh, the move d5. But I don't think that will work. Okay, we see d6. Um, d5 would have attacked the bishop and the queen. Uh, but against both moves, I take on g7, hitting the rook. So even if the pawn was on d5, there'd be no time to take the bishop. And here we're going to show no mercy. Rook's attacked and the pawn is attacked. So rook f8 is um, really the only move. And now, yeah, really putting the hammer down, threatening to take on f8. And the rook is basically trapped here. Um, yeah, the king, the king is trying to run away. Uh, now it is a question, do I want to take the rook? Or do I want to try and keep queens on the board and checkmate as quickly as possible? But I'll keep it simple. I'll take the rook. Because I was already up a bishop. Now I'm up rook and bishop. We're trading queens. It will take a little bit longer to convert this position. Just naturally, without having queens on the board, it takes longer to checkmate. But again, I'll try and be efficient. 
uh, this move f4 aims to open the f file, get the rook involved. The rook is very happy to slide in. And there's a few strategies here. Uh, one of the simplest is just to consume pawns and then use my pass pawns and try and make some queens. Uh, but another strategy is to go for an eventual checkmate without queening a pawn. And yeah, I'm employing a very typical endgame strategy of putting both rooks on the opponent's seventh rank. As the rooks create a battery, and now these pawns are going to be somewhat defenseless. And this is interesting. Like, I could take the rook, but I don't think there's a need. I think I'm going to just start checking. When the king moves, I'm going to take with check. I'll keep taking pawns with check. There's really not much black can do. Anytime I want, I can take the rook as well. But it's basically an all-you-can-eat buffet on the queen side. I'll have my appetizer. Actually, I've already had plenty of appetizers ready for the main course. Okay, my opponent does not appreciate um, being an all-you-can-eat buffet, so yeah, uh, they disconnected. Looks like the game will end before we see checkmate. Uh, now there, there is actually a mating idea. If king c5 take and the king goes back, I wouldn't take the pawns. I just go straight for the king. Play rook hd7 checkmate. Okay, so got the win there. Gained 11 rating points. Yeah, just to show, take with check. If here, it's checkmate. If here, I keep taking. And yeah, once I took, or once I would take all the pawns, and I'd probably take the rook and then uh, just be up a boatload of pawns. So um, I think we'll do one more. I do have to go soon. So next game, I think will be the last game of this episode playing the Zolov, rated 676, from Uruguay. I did not recognize that flag. So I'm black. Every game thus far has been in the King's Pawn opening. And we see Pawn F3, which I'll say right away, it's not a great move, uh, simply because usually the knight likes to go to F3, but also F3 weakens this diagonal. And I'm just going to start with bishop to c5. And now it's going to be very difficult for white to castle efficiently with my bishop just piercing through the diagonal. Uh, with bishop c5, I'm also maybe having some ideas of taking on g1 and then queen h4 to win material. Um, so depending what white does, I'm, I'm sure I'll have some options. We see 92. Okay, so I don't have the option to take the knight. And a move like queen h4 doesn't really do too much damage right away because white well, would have g3 or knight g3. So I think I'd much rather develop here. Uh, now, one plan for white is to try and play d4 and obstruct the bishop. I'm wondering if it makes sense to allow it, I think I'm okay allowing it. I'm gonna play knight to f6. And yeah, what this does is it creates ideas of maybe someday taking the pawn on e4. There are potential tactics where imagine takes, takes, and then check, and then g3, and then take. Um, maybe I can eventually win the rook. We see g4. Uh, now, one tip in the opening, you should almost never combine f3 and g4, even though the pawns create a chain and it does look aggressive. Uh, this, these pawns are smiling from white's perspective. Uh, but the problem with f3 and g4 is it really weakens this diagonal. Um, but the question is, can I exploit it? Because if I take, if I sack the knight and take one of these pawns and then play queen h4, White can block with knight g3. So 
So I don't think I can really punish white immediately as much as I would like to. But maybe the best way to punish white is to play this move d5. Putting immediate pressure on e4. I now have two attackers. And there's only one defender, so we do see a trade. And now I'll take with knight. So not only centralizing the knight, but also looking to play queen h4. Knight g3. Okay, so white's white's trying to make the best of this. And yeah, sometimes even if the opponent does some does some moves which are obviously like not great in the opening, it can still take a lot of patience to to win. And actually this move I think is completely fine. Prepares to develop the bishop. Also, yeah, queen h4 doesn't really do much. So let me exercise some patience. I'm just going to keep developing. Like as I get more, more of my minor pieces into play, then there's going to be gradually more pressure on white's position. But so far, white only has one piece developed. And that one developed piece is moving again. Knight e4, attacking the bishop. There's a move here which I don't think I can resist playing. And honestly, it might be one of the best moves anyway. Now, I should note, of course, I can play queen h4 and make the knight move back. But I have a different idea in mind. I'm going to play knight d4 and say, oh no, my bishop. My bishop is bait because after the knight takes the bishop, yeah, this is checkmate. Uh, that was a little bit cruel, but also a little bit cool. Uh, basically, yeah, the knight um, went a little bit too far away from its defensive role. And now knight g3 is not, not quite possible here. So that was a short and sweet game to finish things off. Um, the main lesson from this game is never play f3 as early as move two. Like there's no opening, I don't think. At least there's no mainstream opening where f3 is a good move so early. Likewise, I, I guess I'll share a quick lesson here. Um, let's say you're playing white and you just play the standard knight f3. Uh, black should never play f6 in this position. Here it's actually even worse uh, moving the f-pawn because there's a tactic knight takes e5, pawn takes e5, and then queen h5. And I don't think I've had any games featuring this yet in the speed run, but sometimes beginners will stumble into this where if g6, you can take and then win the rook. A nice double attack. And then if king e7, um, I think white is very close to mating by force. The queen takes e5, and then bishop c4, and then, yeah, the king goes out for a little walk, and yeah, this is almost checkmate after g5. Uh, black's position is very, very grim. Uh, there's a move here, h4. I know I'm going deep down the rabbit hole, but it's uh, hopefully to confirm the lesson that you should not move the f-pawn so early it does way more damage than good so okay i'm gonna wrap it up here uh thanks everyone for watching hope you learned a thing or two in this episode uh stay tuned for more if you have questions leave them below and i'll see you guys soon